creation of an interlinked, interoperable, and interreliant system of classical language word nets built on the pioneering work of the unfortunately now defunct multi word net project of the Fondazione Bruno Kessler is the ongoing concern of an international team of scholars at the University of Exeter, the University of Pavia, Harvard Center for Hellenic Studies, as well as elsewhere. These projects are helping to bring rich semantic data to the landscape of digital resources for Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin, our concern here, including information about word senses and their relations, lexical field organization, and higher order structures of meaning, such as metaphors and metonymies, all under the perspective of up-to-date theories of meaning, especially um, Roskian prototype theory and Lakoffian conceptual metaphor theory in cognitive semantics. What's more, they're doing so in a way that enables or should enable cross-linguistic comparison of such structures by utilizing a single shared set of sense definitions, what are called sin sets in the WordNet framework, to describe word meaning in all three languages where commonalities can be observed or to pinpoint divergences in semantic configurations. And they make available a standard API, application programming interface, permitting any user or computer application to programmatically access their lexical and semantic content in a consistent manner, regardless of language or simultaneously for all languages. This means that NLP tools already available for the ancient languages or for the languages under consideration can automatically and immediately take advantage of the WordNet data to improve their functionality, accuracy, and scope, or simply to implement new functionality. In this talk, I want to provide some context around the ancient language WordNet project, and then go on to consider what I view as perhaps um, the most exciting, at least from my perspective, but also maybe the most challenging pillar of this overall endeavor, namely the creation of a corpus of semantically annotated Greek and Latin texts, a sembank, similar in inspiration to the digital corpus of Sanskrit. Very specifically, I wanna to broach the topic of textual polyvalency and how a WordNet based text encoding schema could help take account of the natural multiplicity of meanings in discourse and avoid predetermining the interpretation of texts in the course of annotation, an aspect of corpus building that to my lights remains under theorized. I believe this consideration is particularly timely and relevant also for Neo-Latin studies where digital text encoding is ongoing, as we've seen already from some of the talks, ongoing um, you know, in, in haste and, <laughs> and with, a lot, with lots of energy. Uh, and where it also repre represents a case where polyvalency, so the multiple meanings of words in texts, um, can probably more often be ascribed to um, literary motivations than necessarily to textual conditions. Um, of course, as Nevin has uh, mentioned already, there are of course variant readings in manuscript traditions, but um, you know, for many texts, for many later texts, we don't have some of the problems of ancient texts where the, um, where the, uh, the textual record is um, in many cases, just incomplete, highly fragmentary, some to the point of irrecoverability. The WordNet framework allows us to build a robust scaffold for describing the semantic structures of a language at different levels. Just very briefly, in a WordNet, um, lexemes and to a lesser extent, phrasal lexical items are assigned to one or more sin sets which correspond to their various senses. Each sin set can therefore be seen as constituting a set of semantically related words, the words which all share a certain sense as defined by the sin set. For example, the sin set glossed as an individual building where a person resides would include in English, in the English word net, or would be um, a sin set that contains the English words house and home. 
home would also be included in a sin set glossed as a place of emotional attachment where one resides, thus capturing this word's special semantic features and differentiating it semantically from a mere house. A word net can also include information about semantic relations between sin sets, such as antonymy, hypernomy, or holonymy, as well as lexical relations. Sin sets may also be grouped into broader semantic fields or conceptual domains called sem fields. In the word nets of the classical languages, words from Sanskrit, Greek, Latin are keyed to a single pool of sin set identification numbers where appropriate. Thus, in the Latin word net, domus and domicilium are tagged with the same set, same sin set identifier as house and home in the English word net. Just as oikos in the Greek word net and niketa in Sanskrit would be, to the extent that the meanings of these terms do overlap. And of course, each one can have a different overall set of sin sets um, characterizing its particular um, configuration of meanings and senses historically. And of course, as the senses of these words um, in of the words in these languages are very often idiosyncratic, and that's probably what interests us the most about these languages. The word nets, the word nets can include language specific sin sets in order to model the semantic system as accurately as possible. Sensitivity to different kinds of figurative senses and figurative relations between and amongst words of the lexicons is a distinguishing feature of the ancient language word nets, which goes well beyond the Princeton, uh, that's the English word net framework. Whereas the original word net specification treats semantic structure as basically flat, we recognize the importance of figurative relations, both at the level of word sense organization and at the level of the overall organization of the semantic system in terms of supralexical metaphorical and metonymic mappings. So mapping structures, figurative mapping structures that um, do, don't pertain simply to the semantic structure of an indi individual word, but that may, um, uh, that may determine sense relations over the, whole, uh, over the whole lexicon or part of the lexicon at least. Sem fields I had mentioned before are large sets of related sin sets, and they can be conceived as conceptual domains covering very broad fields of semantically related terms. In the original multi word net on which the um, Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit word nets are based, sin sets could be assigned to any of a set of 126 categories of this kind. So, for example, um, broad categories like economy military, architecture. Um, but to deliver the necessary, the necessary granularity of conceptual domains, the ancient language word nets instead use the Dewey Decimal Classification System as a topic index. Now it might seem like a, um, a strange choice, but actually as a, um, as a subject index, as a kind of domain index, the Dewey Decimal class Classification System is quite robust. It includes many domains that are fairly irrelevant to Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit. For example, um, you know, the topic of history of South America probably would not occur very frequently in the senses of Latin words, of Greek words, or extraterrestrial worlds. I think that's 999 in the Dewey Decimal Classification. Probably there aren't many word senses that have to do with extraterrestrial words in these languages, though in Greek, that may, <laughs> that there, there very well may be. But this system provides suitably discrete category distinctions uh, in areas like Greek and Roman religion, Latin literature, philosophy, geography of the ancient world to try to capture these uh, more global relations between words. We have also taken into account the sorts of lexical constructions that tend to typify morphologically complex languages like Greek and Latin by adding new relation, relations such as parasyntheton, that is privative relations between words. Um, just very quickly, um, I'd like us to uh, 
just to just to illustrate this to some degree, just to consider the semantic network of Latin arrow as encoded in the Latin word net, at least partially, this is just a partial representation of um, what the word net contains in terms of the, uh, the word arrow. The lemma entry for arrow specifies a large amount of lexical and morphological information, principal parts, phonological structure, morphological characteristics. Um, we hope to link to databases that include etymological um, information so that um, we can make determinations about etymological senses of words, as well as diachronic and generic information relating to its meanings. Of course, its meanings are recorded as represented by synsets. And here you can see some of those. I've only given their glosses. Um, each one of these glosses, okay, to make a mistake or be incorrect, to wander about aimlessly, right? These are the meanings of the term. Each one of these is a synset that has a unique alphanumeric identifier and which is embedded within the structure of the, <coughs> uh, of the synset hierarchy. Some of them are literal, some are metaphorical, some are metonymic, and, the, and they are marked as such in the database. And of course, this allows us to connect arrow to other words in, um, in the database via its senses, words with which it is at least partially synonymous. Furthermore, each of the synsets participates in a SEM field, and so arrow in, in any of its senses can be linked to other more distantly related concepts and terms. Now, building a large scale or <laughs> hopefully large scale corpus of semantically annotated Latin texts, in other words, a SEM bank for Latin, whose texts encode representations of the meanings of words or larger textual units, so compound forms, fixed phrases, idioms, and so on, utilizing constructs of the word net, represents the next stage of, um, well, this ongoing word net endeavor. This presents a significant challenge, but would yield real dividends in terms of analytic possibilities. Um, just to speak about my own line of research, to be able to process texts computationally um, and at scale on the basis of their meanings, that is the meanings of words, um, would in fact make um, comparative analysis of figurative expressions uh, far easier. I work on metaphor um, and being able to pinpoint um, you know, word, word usages by sense would make, um, would make identifying, identifying metaphors much, much, much easier across, across the corpus, simply by reducing the number of queries that are required to cover the possible lexical makeup of metaphorical expressions. I'll just give you um, one example. Um, you can think of the uh, very common metaphor in Latin that construes war in terms of fire. You can think of expressions like um, in Tacitus, um, flagrabat ingens bellum, okay? A huge war was raging, literally, a huge war was burning. With available corpora and assuming a source domain vocabulary of um, adulera, aduro, aistuara, ardere, ferwere, flagrare, inkendere, torere, okay? All words which mean something like flagrare and a target domain vocabulary of bellum, cartatus, cartamen, collectatio, concertatio, conflictus, congressio, congressus, dimicatio, proelium, pugna, mars, and there are probably others I've forgotten, that is all words which have to do with war, you would have to execute 255 discrete queries to even begin to cover occurrences of this metaphor. So something else is needed, and that is a SEMBank. So SEMBank, it's like tree banking, but for semantic rather than semantic data. Um, in a 
um, if in a tree bank, texts are an annotated by a consistent set of tags which describe their syntactic properties. In a sem bank, texts are annotated according to their semantic properties at one or more levels of description using a tagging structure that's guided by some theory of meaning. In a WordNet best based sem bank, this uh, these annotations would consist of synsets, sem fields, semantic relations, and so on, drawing on any of the constructs delivered by the WordNet architecture. Now, this hasn't begun really to happen yet. This is just a, an endeavor that is um, only at its very beginning stages. Um, and part of the um, part of getting off the ground, in fact, is considering some of the challenges that um, most current encoding practices uh, tend to present. And they present this challenge by adhering to, I guess what we could call the one token, one tag principle, in the sense that generally tokens, words, are not and cannot be tagged with more than one annotation of a given type. In this sense, encoding schemas and practices are determinative and intentionally so, right? This is the lemma, the lemma, the one lemma that is by this word form, right? It requires a determination and a single determination to be made in each instance. Tokens must be annotated and annotators have to make selections to supply the correct reading for a given token. But of course, the philological and literary critical tradition recognizes that texts are instead normally open to multiple readings, which may arise from various causes, divergent transmission histories, interpretive differences due to lexical polysemy, intentional ambiguities, so built-in ambiguities in the text, or simply imaginative expression, including punning, and so on. Semiosis, we know, is open, multi-level, and multi-dimensional, if not actually unlimited. <coughs> so let's get down to um, the nuts and bolts. In many cases, a univocal tagging schema that adheres to this principle, one tag per token, would, would not actually be problematic. If we look at a text like um, the opening phrase, of the preface of Cato's De Agricultura, okay, est interdum praestari mercaturis rem quaerere. Uh, it's true that to obtain money by trade is sometimes more profitable. All right, using just about any text markup schema, and here I've given a kind of Mach 1 in XML, someone annotating this passage semantically, so determining the senses of these words using WordNet sin sets it wouldn't really encounter any difficulties at all. The text is relatively certain and the meanings of the hardly in dispute. If we imagine this schema, okay, we can see that it would capture the senses of the words as they occur here, which can be easily and straightforwardly represented in terms of WordNet sin sets. The markup would just consist of a sequence of tokens with correspond corresponding tags that represent the meaning of each word in terms of a unique sin set. Um, I've included the gloss here just for illustration purposes. Of course, you don't need to do that. You could just have the token and the sin set reference number and the gloss, if you need it, can be, um, you know, could be pulled via the API from um, from the WordNet or elsewhere. It's useful, obviously, for us to see uh, how the glosses of the sin sets relate to the meanings of the words in, um, in this particular text. You could also annotate um, meanings at a higher order of structure than the, than the word. For instance, rem quirere is a conventionalized idiom and as a sense-bearing unit could be independently tagged with another sin set which could mean something like earn on some commercial or business transaction. So each of those words has its own synset definition, rem and quirere, but together they have 
a distinct combinatorial meaning, distinct from the senses of its constituent elements, that is. This would only require some kind of additional markup element, maybe a phrase element, capable of incorporating one or more tokens and likewise taggable with a synset ID number. <coughs> Excuse me. There's the, uh, you know, just a kind of proposal, just envisioning what a, what a phrase synset attribution could, um, could, look, could look like. Again, distinct from the synsets of the individual tokens, but still capturing the meaning within the context of the sentence. Something similar can be said for the varii lectiones that characterize the manuscript traditions of some ancient texts. A schema for semantic annotation must be able to take account of such variations, which may have consequences on meaning. Take the phrase in Vegetius's De Re Militare, non enim tantum celerio sedentiam perfectios imbuuntur quae discuntur apuris. Okay, roughly, what things are learned by young children not only are more quickly, but also more completely absorbed. The Editio Princeps preserves the reading of several manuscripts, namely imbuuntur, are absorbed, but another line of transmission preserves imbibuntur, which has been accepted and printed by the editor of the Oxford Classical Text, in fact. So we have a difference in meaning represented, captured by the difference in, uh, in manuscript readings. Imbibuntur are drunken in, and imbuuntur are soaked in, both obviously figurative, but with a different uh, figurative use. So they would have the same contextual metaphorical sense, but a different literal sense. More interesting perhaps is a case like Columello's, um, this one from Columello's De Re Rustica. One branch of transmission preserves um, the form relinquendi of passing on. And another branch preserves the equally plausible but entirely different retinendi of holding on to which entails a fairly radical change in meaning and, require, and requiring discrete semantic annotation. So we want a schema that can capture these alternate readings. Alongside variae lectiones, characterizing transmission histories of ancient texts or all sorts of texts, there are also interpretive differences that arise at the point of reception. I mean, those many cases where completely apart from any divergences in the actual state of the text, modern scholarship recognizing, recognizes the possibilities of different readings. So for example, very famously, <coughs> Catullus's expression, pudicitiam matris indicet ore, he may declare the fair fame of his mother by his os, Okay, this has been the site of um, long debates about the meaning of the, that word os. Should it be interpreted as face or more specifically as mouth and by metonymical extension as speech? Um, the latter hypothesis was put forth by Maurizio Bettini. Uh, I think that's probably the, um, the correct one, but you could even mark, you can give bibliographical information. You could imagine a system where you could give even bibliographical information relating to the different readings, <clears throat> the different interpretations of, um, of a single token. These are at the level of reception rather than um, transition. An adequate annotation schema would probably need to represent the two readings together rep as represented by synsets. Now, in a case like that, these alternative readings, well, you want to choose one or the other, right? Os means mouth here, or os means face here. We, we wanna capture that both are possible, but in a sense, the, the reading of the poem is going to depend on choosing one, of, one or the other. 
Now, there are cases where we simply don't want to do that at all. I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit here and talk um, uh, and take the case of puns. <coughs> okay, puns, we know what puns are. Um, word plays that function by simultaneously activating two independent meanings, right? Actually, the efficacy, the joke of a pun rests precisely on its ability, uh, on the audience's ability to simultaneously consider the multiple senses of a word or phrase. That's what makes a pun funny. Consider the Latin word ius, for instance. It can mean both law and soup, as everybody knows. Okay. In mocking the fashion among wealthy Romans of um, tending different kinds of fish in separate ponds, um, the author Varro jokes that the obsession with fish keeping has reached such a point that hos piscis Nemo cocos in use vocare audet. The joke being that fish are nowadays held in such esteem that making a stew of them is tantamount to violating their legal rights. The same ambiguity permits subtler puns too, like Plautus's reference to lawyers as juris coctiores, okay, cookers of soup, cookers of law which obviously plays on the twin meaning of jus and the possible figurative reading of coctus as well in the sense of learned or knowledgeable and also obviously relating to cooking. In Kistellaria, play by Plautus, the ambiguity allows um, the character Malinus to compare lovers, lovers' oaths, jus jurandum amantium, unfavorably to a Thursday night soup, a jus confus uh, confusicium, that is a concoction of hastily thrown together leftovers. Uh, and the list goes on and on. This is a very, very frequent, uh, very frequent pun. But the, the pun depends on both readings being present in the text at the same time, being activated at the same time. That's a um, kind of straightforward example. I will. Um, come very quickly to the end of my paper just by presenting um, one or two very uh, quick final cases. Uh, this is a poem by Alanos de Insulis, Alain de Lille, Omnis Mundi Creatura, probably well known to uh, very many to you. I'll just point out <coughs> the, um, the ambiguity in the first line of the text, Omnis Mundi Creatura. Uh, this is a syntactic ambiguity, the, uh, which depends on does Omnis modify creatura or does it modify mundi and um, you know depending on where we take the adjective that also interacts with a um, with a semantic difference in the meaning structure of creatura you can interpret this as every creature of the world or the creation of the whole world and actually um, the meaning of the poem one could argue depends on precisely that ambiguity that is both perspectives are necessary to understanding what overall this poem is about. Um, I'll just conclude with uh, an example that's perhaps a bit closer to home very quickly. Uh, this is um, the poem of uh, John Owen in Amorem Nudum. <laughs> um, the, the ambiguity belongs basically to um, this last line, quo nudus magis est hoc minus I'll get amor, where we have an interplay of the, um, of the meaning of uh, uh, algeo, okay, being cold, that is figuratively diminishing, something like that, and um, love. So whether we're talking about, um, in one reading of the poem, we're talking about Cupid, okay? Amor personified, and there's a kind of physical, literal interpretation of I'll get, he gets cold, the more naked love is, okay? So the less he gets cold, alongside a figurative punning meaning 
that has to do with um, the sense of amor probably as sex, okay? Sort of the more nude it is, okay? The, the less love gets cold, it languishes, something like that, or even diminishes. So there's a, there's a punning, um, there's an innuendo, uh, a fairly strong and obvious innuendo in, um, in the text that would need to be represented by, uh, by any um, semantic annotation in the synsets. And I've just talked about these different cases. I'll finish up now. Um, just talked about these different cases to, to highlight some of the challenges that uh, annotators would, um, would and do confront in, um, in constructing a corpus of this, uh, of this kind. For classical Latin, that's where my main interest has been, but of course for, uh, for all sorts of texts from all different periods. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.